The infinite blackness of space, punctuated by the gleam of billions of indifferent stars, can be a cradle of calmness, or a source of wonder for the restless soul. But one cannot help but feel a hint of terror at the thought of what might emerge from that vastness. What if one of those immobile dots of light in the night sky were to suddenly become larger? What if it were to approach our planet at inconceivable velocity? Few things can be more terrifying than the idea that an asteroid might strike Earth's surface with all of its force, unleashing a level of destruction that would dwarf dwarf most nuclear weapons. But here is an even scarier thought. What if an asteroid could be redirected on purpose to annihilate a geopolitical adversary? What if asteroid strikes could be intentional? Well, welcome to today's episode of Astrographics, in which we're going to explore a concept that would make a super villain quiver with delight. The possibility to use deflected asteroids as weapons of mass destruction, also known as Ivan's Hammer. The phrase Ivan's Hammer, associated with the concept of weaponized asteroids, made its appearance on the interwebs in 2010. The origin of the terminology is not clear, at least to us, although uh, we must admit that it has an incredibly menacing ring to it, and it left us wondering if there is a tactic called Yuri Sickle buried somewhere under the Kremlin. What was easier to trace is how the notion was first conceived and popularized. On January the 18th, 1962, the Evening Star newspaper of Washington, D.C. published a small article titled, Scientist Sees Asteroid as Sneak Superbomb. This piece, originally written by the Associated Press, referred to aerospace engineer Dandridge M. Cole, an employee of General Electric's missile and space vehicle development. At the eighth annual meeting of the American Astronautical Society, Cole delivered a speech titled, A Possible Military Application of a cis Martian asteroid. During this, he announced that an asteroid could be used as a cataclysmic weapon sometime after 1970. According to Cole, a Nova class rocket could transport a crew of men or remote controlled devices to the surface of an asteroid. There, the crew, human or otherwise, would detonate a number of H bombs to deflect the asteroid off its orbit and toward Earth. It would strike with a force of several million megaton. Cole added that, quote, This unusual weapon system shares with the biological weapons the possibility for masquerading as a natural catastrophe. The attacker could hope to escape blame and retribution from surviving retaliation forces. The engineer admitted that this concept seemed highly implausible, but predicted that advances in aerospace engineering would make it possible to weaponize astronauts post-1970. Cole's sinister predictions came at a time of peak tension during the Cold War. The Berlin Wall had been erected a few months earlier in August 1961, sparking a tense standoff between US and Soviet tank units. On January the 18th, 1962, when Cole's theory was reported by the AP, well, that was also the date in which both armored forces withdrew from the Berlin flashpoint. It is understandable then if Cole added, if it is assumed that the Russians would like to obliterate the United States and run little risk of retaliation, then they would reasonably consider the use of a close approach asteroid for this purpose. For clarity, Cole never referred to this concept as Ivan's hammer, nor reported that the Soviets may have actually theorized it, let alone developed it. He simply stated that post 1970s technology would make it possible to detonate H bombs over asteroids to deflect them, and that he warned the Soviet Union may consider this tactic. So, did they? Well, we can safely state that the Soviet Union had an ambitious space weapons program. Let's start small, shall we? Throughout this glorious era of the space race, Soviet engineers conceived small arms for their cosmonauts. There is one surviving prototype of a small laser pistol designed to project a beam capable of disabling optical sensors on enemy spacecraft. It could also blind a person at a distance of 20 meters. In parallel, in the late 1950s, the Soviet armed forces launched the Spiral Project to develop a fighter plane capable of operating beyond the atmosphere. This space plane would take off from an aircraft carrier, soar to an altitude of 130 kilometers, and perform reconnaissance missions to acquire potential targets both on the ground and in orbit. The Spiral Program also involved the future development of fighter-like capabilities by equipping planes with self-guided missiles able to hit enemy targets in space at a distance of up to 350 kilometers. The program, however, never progressed beyond the early prototype type stage, one of which, the MiG-10511, can be seen at the Menino Central Air Force Museum. In the late 1970s, Soviet aerospace engineers steered their attention toward orbital space stations, devising two concepts, Skiff and Cascade, to be equipped with a laser or missiles respectively. Their goal would have been to knock enemy satellites out of their orbit, but both projects were abandoned in the early 1980s. Despite all the ambition and the inventiveness, it appears that the only Soviet space weapon to progress beyond a blueprint or prototype phase was the so-called satellite fighter. 
fighter, an unmanned interceptor capable of destroying enemy satellites. The fighter was to be equipped with two retractable warheads. Each would fire a hail of 5mm metal spheres, similar to buckshot, which is potentially devastating against a satellite's delicate machinery. Based on a design by engineer Vladimir Cholomi, the satellite fighter concept was approved by the Soviet Politburo on June the 23rd, 1960. The first test flight took place on November the 1st, 1963. No shots were fired, but the craft proved to be a success as it responded correctly to the commands beamed from the ground. And now look, all of this is extremely fascinating, but it proves that Dandridge Cole's concerns were unfounded. Were the Soviets considering a militarization of space? Yeah, sure. But had they any interest, let alone the resources, to project their power toward the nearest asteroid? Well, no, absolutely not. Whatever space weapons programs the Soviets developed in the 1960s and 70s appeared to be focused on targeting enemy satellites by the means of missiles, lasers, or good old-fashioned buckshot. The potential risks posed by the concept of asteroid deflection were voiced by American astronomers Carl Sagan and Stephen J. Ostro in their April 1994 letter, Dangers of Asteroid Deflection. It was published by the journal Nature, alongside another missive called Statistical Scrotal Effects, which argued that castration may lead to an increased longevity in men. It's completely unrelated to today's video, but we thought it was funny. The letter, the space one, was a commentary to two previous scientific articles, one of them co-authored by Sagan and Ostro themselves, which explored the possibility of protecting Earth from meteor impacts through, quote, a herding series of standoff nuclear explosions. It's the basic plot point of Deep Impact and Armageddon. Sagan and Ostro argued that, quote, this proposal is a double-edged sword. If we can perturb an asteroid out of impact trajectory, it follows that we can also transform one on a benign trajectory into an Earth impactor. They cited the example of asteroid 1991-OA. Based on its predicted orbital trajectory, in the year 2070, it could be deflected towards Earth, quote, with an aggregate yield of only about 60 megatons. Sagan and Ostro highlighted the slim chances of giant space rocks hitting our planet out of their own volition, and were more concerned about a potential misuse of an asteroid deflection system designed to protect Earth. Earth, quoting again, those who argue that it would be prudent to prevent catastrophic impacts with annual probabilities of 10 to the power of 5 will surely recognize the prudence of preventing more probable catastrophes of comparable magnitude from misuse of a potentially apocalyptic technology. Since Sagan's and Ostro's intervention, the scientific community appeared largely not preoccupied by the risk of Ivan's hammer. That was until the publication of the 2002 report Space Weapons Earth Wars. Prepared for the US Air Force by the Rands Corporation, a non profit institution that helps improve policy and decision-making through research and analysis, this report considered a vast array of weapon systems which could be used in and from space to hit targets located on Earth's surface or in space itself. One of the options evaluated is the use of kinetic energy weapons, commonly known to you and me as man-made big-ass objects which could be dropped from space onto some poor sod or several millions of them. The author of the report, Robert Preston, compared the effects of a kinetic energy weapon to those of an asteroid or meteoroid. He then proceeded to assess the viability of directly using an asteroid as a kinetic energy weapon in lengthly Appendix C, which, with all due respect to Mr. Preston, reads like a handbook for aspiring supervillains. So, for all of you bargain bin Dr. Dooms out there, it's time to pull out your human skin bound notebooks, for we're going to dive deep into Appendix C, because it's a lot more interesting than just being Appendix C would have you believe. The first consideration is finding the right asteroid or meteorite. It has to be the right size and composition so that it can be easily nudged towards the target. First of all, you might want to avoid objects with diameters of more than 100 meters. These are extremely rare, and you may end up waiting for millennia before one of these big boys approaches Earth's atmosphere. The second concern is that objects this size may end up obliterating the entire population. Now, if you're a nihilistic type of supervillain, this may be right up your alley, but if you're a run-of-the-mill dictator, you better pick a smaller rock so as to focus mayhem on a specific enemy. A good choice would be to go for a diameter between 10 and 50 meters. Objects of this size are much more common, and the range of destruction can be controlled more easily. But you have to be careful when it comes to their composition. Depending on their size and velocity, stony asteroids will probably ignite and burst before touching Earth's surface. The subsequent explosion may cause deafening bangs, powerful airbursts, and raging fires, but no crater, as observed at the so-called Tunguska event. In military terms, the results may be similar to that of a firebombing. Think Tokyo or Dresden in World War II. Stony ammo, however, may fragment higher up in the atmosphere, resulting in showers of meteoroids which will have little tactical, let alone strategic impact. If you want higher chances of inflicting misery, the Rand report points out how iron-rich asteroids are more likely to slam straight into the planet and produce a crater. The cited example is the 1,200-meter-wide Barringer crater 
equator in Arizona. This was caused by an asteroid rich in nickel and iron, 50 meters in diameter, which fell over Arizona some 50,000 years ago. The energy of the impact has been estimated at 10 megatons. That's 500 times more powerful than the Fat Man bomb dropped on Nagasaki in 1945. The Rand Report next tackles what it would take to steer your chosen asteroid towards your target. Good news here, as quoting the report, diverting the course of an asteroid requires only a small delta V. To clarify, delta V indicates a change in velocity, but the bad news is that you should apply this small change in velocity when the asteroid is an extremely long distance from Earth. Quoting again, deflecting an asteroid within days of its closest approach to Earth would require a very large delta V on the scale of kilometers per second. In basic terms, the further your space boulder is, the less energy you have to use to change its course. And that poses another problem, precision. You'd have to apply that change in velocity with millimetrical accuracy over the asteroid's surface. Otherwise, you will score an embarrassing failure. As Mr. Preston put it, an error of only about 1% could alter the impact point by about 1,000 kilometers. In other words, you'd need to act with the precision of a pro pool player. A giant billiard cue won't cut it. So how would you go about actually deflecting your harbinger of doom? Dandridge Cole has suggested using a Nova-class rocket to ferry a number of H-bombs alongside some technicians or remotely controlled robots to the asteroid. The Rand author proposes instead to attach a device to the asteroid to act as a mass launcher, using the asteroid's own material as propellant and the sun as a power source. No further clarity is offered as to what a mass launcher actually is, but it might be today what we refer to as a mass driver or electromagnetic catapult. In any case, this device appears to be extremely complex. The Rand report states that the launcher would need to fire tens of thousands of shots. It also notes an error in a single shot would cause a noticeable target error. Moreover, to function properly, it would require a massive amount of solar energy collected via a huge solar array with a surface area of at least 2,500 square meters. That's about three-fifths of Bill Gates' home, if you were wondering, and Bill Gates lives in a large house. The weight of all the needed equipment would weigh tons, which poses the problem of how one would realistically carry it all the way to the asteroid. The Rand's paper does not explore this logistical aspect, but it states quite obviously that the lead time to assemble the equipment and prepare the expedition would take several months. To get a head start, the report suggests initiating prep work years in advance, as it would take months and months of research to identify the right candidate asteroid. The extension of such a devious project over the period of years would also increase the risk of failure, as during that time your opponents might sabotage your operations or you might be overthrown by a disgruntled minion. To quote the report again, a substantial delay would allow time for second thoughts, recriminations, political changes, and opponent responses. To further squash your supervillain dreams of world domination, Rand throws in another substantial hurdle, budget. It's not easy to put a price tag on an asteroid steering scheme, but the report uses as a reference point a 1977 proposal to generate solar power in space. The estimated budget for that plan was $102 billion, which is uh, $537.6 billion in today's value. And that's only the cost to power your launcher. Once you add the cost for the mass launcher itself and for the vector to take it all up there, we're easily, easily in the trillion dollar range. A trillion dollars, which would not guarantee success, given the enormously high chances that the asteroid might miss the target, disintegrate in the atmosphere, or simply not be available in the first place. And at that point, most supervillains would probably just rather use nukes. Nukes are uh, relatively cheap. Robert Weston and the RAND team seem to agree, as they conclude their analysis of asteroid deflection with this assessment. Because much cheaper, more responsive weapons of mass destruction are readily available, this one is likely to remain safely in the realm of science fiction. Or is it? On September the 26th, 2022, NASA proved the RAND Corporation wrong. That was the day in which they scored an enormous success with their DART program, or Double Asteroid Redirection Test. But let's backtrack for a moment, shall we? Back in 2007, NASA had prepared a number of proposals on how asteroids could be deflected. Mind you, the Aeronautics and Space Administration was not looking for ways to destroy Earth, but rather to protect it by swatting away incoming space rocks. Their proposed solution was to use nuclear missiles, but amongst other options, they considered the kinetic impactor technique described by the Planetary Society as such. The principle behind the kinetic impactor technique is simple. Slam an object, like a spacecraft, into an asteroid, 
changing its trajectory. Years later, NASA decided to focus their efforts on perfecting this technique, launching the DART program. Here's the plan. NASA would use a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket to propel into space a 570 kilogram box-shaped craft. This craft would travel some 11 million kilometers, heading toward Didymos, a large asteroid 780 meters in diameter. The real target, however, would be Dimorphos, an asteroid moonlit orbiting Didymos, measuring 160 meters. Why the moonlet? Oh, well, because the impact would likely result in an alteration of its orbit, which would make for an easily measurable outcome, and you could observe that via the Hubble Space Telescope and the Lycia Cube, a specialized camera provided by the Italian Space Agency. The DART program team expected their box-shaped craft to deliver a strike capable of shortening Dimorphos' orbit from 11 hours and 55 minutes to 11 hours and 45 minutes. So, how did it go? Well, we're happy to report that everything went great. On November 23, 2021, the SpaceX Falcon 9 took off from Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. The vector helped the DART craft make its way to Didymos and Dimorphos without hitches, and impact took place on the 26th of September 2022. At the time of collision, the kinetic impact craft was traveling at a speed of 21,000 kilometers per hour, which caused some 37 boulders to splinter off the surface of the asteroid. Andrew Chang of Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory calculated that the impact had caused an immediate slowing down of the asteroid of about 2.7 millimeters per second. More importantly, the orbit of Dimorphos around the larger asteroid was reduced by 33 minutes. That's 23 minutes more than the predicted shortening. In other words, the dark craft proved capable of deflecting the course of a 160-meter asteroid far beyond the planner's expectations. According to an investigation team led by Christina Thomas, Northern Arizona University, this exceedingly good result was favored by the 37 boulders mentioned earlier. These are classified as ejecta, i.e. material excavated from the asteroid by the impact and then flung into space. The recoil caused from this ejector, quote, contributed significant momentum change to the asteroid beyond that of the DART spacecraft itself. This was a multiple win for NASA. They had proved that asteroids could indeed be deflected without the use of nukes by applying the much simpler kinetic impactor technique. Not only that, but they also showed that an asteroid millions of kilometers away could be reached and intercepted without an advanced reconnaissance mission, which would have doubled the cost and effort of the entire operation. Next, they uncovered the unexpected effect of ejector which can highly increase the effect of the strike delivered by the impact of craft. And lastly, they prove that asteroids can be successfully deflected at a reasonable price tag. And by reasonable, we mean $325 million, which is a lot, but it is a fraction of the $537 billion forecast by the Rand Corporation back in 2002. So the success of DART is a bright beacon for humanity. An asteroid is threatening to wipe us all out. Dinosaur Star World, fear not, Earthlings, for a box designed by NASA equipped with an attack Italian camera and ferried by Elon Musk's rocket will slap that rock like the bit is and hurl it back into the cosmic depths. But jokes aside, the outcome of DART was truly impressive. But unfortunately, it resurfaced the concerns once shared by Sagan and Ostro, which we may call the deflector paradox. The same technology which may save humanity from an asteroid impact makes it possible to turn asteroids into malevolent weapons of mass destruction. What could stop a supervillain or rogue government from darting an enemy state into a rubble? A point of view is that catastrophic concerns aren't justified. Sure, NASA was able to deflect an asteroid for the relatively affordable cost of $325 million, slightly more than a high-end fighter jet, but those $325 million bucks rest on the broad shoulders of decades worth of continuous, intensive research and development. As as well as an annual budget of $23 billion. Realistically, neither condition is within the reach of most governments. Besides, swatting a rock away from a target does not require a particularly precise aim, whereas steering it towards said target is a much more complicated affair with immensely higher chances for it to go wrong. So for all of you supervillains out there, you'll uh, have to think of something else other than Ivan's hammer. World domination's gonna have to wait.